Calaveras County, and welcome to another edition of Mondo Calaveras. I'm your host, Mike Taylor. Now, we have our fun here on the show, and every once in a while we get a little serious, and today might be a little bit of a mix of that. Um, in a recent broadcast, I mentioned what our state legislature has done to education, and I'll be honest with you, I've been to enough meetings. It hasn't been our local folks' fault, and I'm thrilled to have one of our locals here today, Mark Campbell, the superintendent of the Calaveras Unified School District. Thanks for being here, Mark. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet. Now, Calaveras Unified has been in, I want to say, two years in qualified status with the budget? At, at least two years. Okay. Yes. And <clears throat> basically what happened about two years ago, the financial rug came out from under you, uh, the, the district, not you personally. Correct. Correct. And uh, things got really scary really quick. And then things kind of leveled off. Has that been because of Sacramento, and are they actually funding education a little better, or? And actually a combination of, of many factors. I would say Sacramento, Sacramento yes, legislature uh, pushing out more money to mm -hmm. us as part of local control funding formula, so, so that increase in revenue has helped. I would say that the dr dramatic cuts that, that we, we, you know, we, we nicked away at, at our problem mm -hmm. for many, many years, uh, didn't nick as much as we should have, and, and so that really you know, came to bear, as, as you'd mentioned, in 2014, 15. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we, we made about a million dollars worth of cuts last, mm -hmm. you know, last year for this year. Uh -huh. uh, dramatic and painful, but that, coupled with an increase in revenue, has us comparatively stable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the, um, the cuts that came also kind of had to come along because as the economy tanked, you were losing students left and right, right? Yeah, absolutely. It was maybe 10 years ago, we were at 3,700 students, mm -hmm. you know, give or take. Right now, we're at 3,000. And oh so my we, gosh. We, we've okay. been losing, on, on average, about 60 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's flattened out somewhat this year. We didn't lose as many okay. as we had projected. However, we mm -hmm. still lost students. So, so I, as you alluded to, lose students, you need to lose staff unless mm -hmm. you have a, a dramatic amount of reserves to, with which to pull from, and, sure. and we don't. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and the state also mandates the amount of reserve oh. you're supposed to keep in the budget, which is, what, about 3% for Man, CUSD? A, a minimum of 3%. You know, okay. The, 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 so minimum of 3%, which one of the factoids that always sticks in my brain, isn't even a month's payroll Correct. for your district, is Correct. it? How many employees are at the district? Right now we're about 350, a little over 350. Okay, and that's teachers and uh, Te classified, classified staff, Correct. which is the Correct. janitors and secretaries and food service and bus drivers. Correct. Okay. And uh, so 3,000 students, basically the entire north half of the county. Correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah, I mean, we, our total enrollment is, is greater than all the other districts combined. Yeah, okay. So more than half the students in the county. What is the biggest challenge from the top of the heap, so to speak, as the superintendent in getting the education to be good down at the point where a student is sitting at the desk? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question because that's what we tend to, we want to spend most of our time on. How do we improve instruction, you know, that, mm -hmm. that first level of instruction to our students? And, and I would s state that, that we have phenomenal staff, amazing staff, mm -hmm. great people doing great things for kids every day. But over the course of the last eight years, at least, we've watched our class sizes steadily increase. Mm -hmm. So that presents a, a whole other challenge to get to the, to the question specifically. It's professional development. It's training. It's, it's giving our teachers okay. time, uh, and that costs money. Uh, and it, it's time out of the classroom so they can collaborate and, and, identi and identify what they need to, to improve upon and, mm -hmm. and, and get that training, or sending teachers to training, bringing in professionals to train. So, it, it, and with the transition to new state standards, it's just it's, it's amplified our, our need for professional development. Mm -hmm. But again, that costs time and that costs money, and those are two two resources that we don't have a tremendous amount of. The, you just almost touched on it, didn't quite say the magic buzzwords, <laughs> and that is Common Core. Right. How is that, from an educator's point of view, how are teachers and staff viewing Common Core? Is it the next godsend in educating kids, or is it as controversial in schools as it seems to keep wanting to be outside of schools? Now, and you mentioned a buzzword. Whenever you use a buzzword, automatically a shield goes yeah. up, you know, <laughs> a, right. a deflector, a cynical shield, if <laughs> yeah. you will. Uh, and, and so really the direction has been don't refer to it as Common Core because oh. it has a whole political con connotation to it. Okay. So new state standards. New state standards. It, it's, it, it's Common Core. It's new state standards. Uh, and internally, less political. I internally, mm -hmm. you know, philosophically, people are embracing it mm -hmm. because it really is a, a, a reversion back. You know, every 
ed education does this, and the pendulum swings. Mm -hmm. We've been pre pretty uh, consistent. It, it, when it swings one way, we don't swing all the way with it. We, we find that balance. Somewhere uh, in the middle. Mm -hmm. it's somewhere in the middle, and, and, and right now, in, in terms of the actual teaching, you know, the teaching strategies that Common Core calls for, uh, it, it's tremendously up the alley of, of where we've always tried to be and always tried to have our staff be. Oh, great. The work that's involved, though, in transitioning the, the curriculum and the instruction uh, back to to that to that 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 more project-based learning, the, the collaborative mm -hmm. learning, and and all that. Again, it takes a lot of time, so it's just very overwhelming for our staff. Sure. Uh, and, and so excited, scared, uh, at times confused, um, mm -hmm. very, very enthusiastic about learning and growing. But, but this will take some time. And the the other sort of connection slash disconnection with all of this is testing. And, mm -hmm. and, and th 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 there always seems to be this question of how do we measure how our students are doing. And my personal opinion is that the old system was a joke. And the reason I say that is because I've talked to many educators mm -hmm. like yourself who, who looked at the data. Here comes the data from last year's fourth graders that you cannot compare those, that data to this year's fifth graders to see how those students grew. Is this new system of new state standards, uh, <laughs> is that kind of going to provide some of that? Because I know we just had the first testing with the new program this past year? Yes, was yes it past, this past spring. Past spring. So it, it, does it look like, because I know you're just going to kind of get some numbers and you won't quite know what to do with them quite yet, will you? No, and, and, so, and so that's the, the blessing and the curse that goes with this. And I could talk forever on this, and so be a good, be a good host and cut me off <laughs> okay. if, 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 I, if I go too far. Because the, the way this is sold to us, this new assessment system, is that it will do that. It will be more authentic, it, it, mm -hmm. and it will be, will be able to better track you know, the, this year's fourth graders and how, how they actually did the following year, as opposed to comparing apples to oranges sure. and, and, and this year's fifth graders to last year's fifth graders. So ostensibly, that, that's the direction that, that we're going to go in. Uh, the, these tests are more authentic uh, in, in that right now what we're looking looking at is a package where we'll have three interim assessments throughout the year oh. and then the summative. Okay. And, and those will align with the standards. Those won't just be a drop-in assessment as mm -hmm. opposed to, to the content standards test, the STAR test that, yeah. that you were referring to, which really didn't fit. Mm -hmm. um, so this allows us to teach to the standards not teach to the test because the test will fold into what we're teaching already. Oh, great. And, and again, that's, it's all great in theory until mm -hmm. you see the application and, and every rollout has its bumps. We took the test last spring uh, and, and we scored pretty even on average with the state. Uh, okay. But but we, we didn't score as well with, with other schools in the county at, at, at elementary mm -hmm. level in particular. And, and so looking at last year's data with nothing to compare it to, mm -hmm. this year's data that we'll do in spring 2016. And, then, and then, then we have something to look at, look at the gaps, and look at where we need to, to really focus our energy. Sure. What then happens when Johnny or Becky, I'm just pulling names out, <laughs> but uh, wh what happens when that student starts to show signs of falling behind? What kinds of programs pop up and help them out? And, and, and so, the, the, and this is where our, our budget crunch really impacts us dramatically, mm -hmm. because we. And it's one thing also with the state standardized test that we don't look at just that piece of data. Just like you mm -hmm. know, and I, I always tried to minimize the impact of star test because it was one piece of data, mm -hmm. and, and not necessarily the most accurate piece of data. Okay. Same thing. With, even even though these assessments are more authentic, our, our teachers are doing assessments year round. So we're, we're pulling in all this sure. data. So, so you look at a Johnny or a Becky and, and look at their gaps and what is it that we have to offer them and, and in, a, in a better world in terms of interventions, academic interventions, we have either, either tra you know, trained you know, teachers going into the classroom to mm -hmm. provide that more in individualized or small group uh, oh, okay. uh, support, mm -hmm. or we pull students out during the day. Okay. And, 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 and it's just targeting their areas of weakness, giving them that additional instruction that other focus students Focus on need. reading, focus on multiplication, exactly. focus on algebra, which would mean I would still be in high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. But, you know, and, and bouncing around time a little bit, we didn't do much of your history here, but um, it's probably not a secret to many viewers, but you and I went to high school together yes, at yes, Calaveras did. High School. Did you ever in a million years think you'd be the superintendent of the school district where you went to high school? <laughs> I didn't. I, I know and, and nobody else did either. So, so no, that, that, that was something that was so far off, off the, the radar at mm -hmm. that time. No, nobody could have seen that coming. And so you went in, uh, you became a classroom teacher. Correct. T taught and for one year in Stockton, then, then came, came home. Came home, and you were teaching at Toyon? Correct. 
Yeah, okay. Taught there for four years. Okay. And then you made the turn, as everybody says, to the dark side. Went to the dark side. I, I, personally, I don't consider that it, that, and I will tell the viewers why right here. Our local administrators, in my experience, especially as this budget crunch, as the economy just really hit the skids, and we lost so many students, families struggled. Our administrators in this county, folks, do an incredible job of staying ahead of all of this. And in speaking with them, uh, you get the sense that, no, they're not trying to shuffle anything. They're not tap dancing. They're looking and looking ahead. But it's really difficult. I am going somewhere with this. <laughs> it's really difficult for school districts to look ahead. And it's because of the folks that you have sent to Sacramento. And the reason I say that is because the state develops a budget on a year-to-year-to-year -year -year basis. Nobody cares if it can pay its bills the year after next. Nobody cares if it's going to have a ton of money the year after next, well, except for folks in education. But schools, you have to demonstrate that you can pay your bills for three years out, don't correct, you? Correct. That's got to be a nightmare to develop a budget on numbers that don't exist. Numbers that don't exist and num numbers that even when, when they do exist officially in, in, in June or July will change throughout the year. Mm -hmm. What they tell us, for instance, for this year, what, what they indicated that we would be getting in, re in terms of revenue uh, in July of 2015, we truly don't get that money until October, September or October of 2017. Wow. Or 2016, I apologize. 16, yeah. So, so, so we're in as as the re as the state revenue fluctuates mm -hmm. and th then our budget fluctuates and, and we're making those adjustments on the fly be best case projections and mm -hmm. doing the, you know the best we can to make sure that that we're fiscally responsible yeah. and, and and stable so yeah it it, it, it is a challenge it's it's kind of like making up a budget and not knowing where you're doing your banking yes. is how I would equate it yes. for being kind of a private citizen. And that's where I personally say pay very close attention to who you send to the legislature and for that matter to the governor's chair, but I'll do that at the end of this. <laughs> um, Calaveras Unified has, um, has schools in practically every community on this, this side of the county. Right. And some of those schools are really small, and there's been a lot of question as this difficult budget time has come along if those small schools can be sustained. Does it look like they're going to be around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say, you know, the board issued mm -hmm. a three-year moratorium to, by, by which we wouldn't even be discussing small school closures. Okay. Uh, and, and so I don't see the board changing direction on that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about sustainable, you know, it, it, it depends on, on, on your perspective as to what that looks like. Those schools will remain open because of our, but our, the budget challenges that we still face. Even, mm -hmm. with, even with the in, in, increase in revenue from the state, we still yeah. have many challenges that we're facing. Uh, they become difficult to sustain at the same level as other mm -hmm. schools. Uh, and so you'll, you, you'll see three grade combination classes, four grade combination classes sure. at Rural Flat because we're staffing them at the, at the same ratio, 30 students to one, one teacher, yeah. that, that, that we do at all, all schools. Which sites. is, as I've heard teachers say, fourth graders don't come in nice little 26 student packages. Right. There might be 31 fourth graders at a particular school site. So uh, what is your your biggest elementary school? Is that Jenny Lind? Biggest elementary school is Jenny Lind. They're just a little bit over 500. Right now, I think 520. Okay, so that's almost Calaveras High's population, right? And no. Well, it, it's actually it's a little bit a little bit more than Toyon Middle School. Okay. You know, Calaveras High School is about 950, 955. Oh, they are up there right now. now. Right. Okay, so right. a few more high schoolers than, because it seemed like the last couple of years, high school was down a little bit lower than we, that. We, we, we've tickled 900, you know, every now and then, it's usually okay. between 900 and, and, and 1,000. Okay, so roughly 400 more than there were when we were going. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yes. Um, and speaking of Calaveras High School, sort of finally, in a lot of folks' minds, the Performing Arts Center yes. was christened uh, just this past month. How has that been? No, that's, and that's been fantastic. You know, and you talk about going to the dark side, <laughs> uh, and, and I know, it, it, and I think our job also is to take the dark times and shine lights on them because there's so much to celebrate. Mm -hmm. We've had eight years of a lot of darkness, fiscal darkness. Yes. Programmatically, we've been able to, to maintain a lot of our programs, and the Performing Arts Center is just a, a, a shining example of that. Mm -hmm. We've maintained our, our, our music program, our drama program, our arts programs overall with many districts, you know, when we went through the recession, sliced and diced. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. Um, yeah. 
there on the block quite often, and that was unsettling to sure. be sure. So we, so we, yeah, we we have this four million dollar you know, facility now that really allows our students a chance to, to p- perform and be heard, and, and for parents to see them perform. Uh, sure. And 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 the responses have been phenomenal, and the performances have been outstanding, uh, and, and so it, it was worth the ten year. Uh, epic saga that we had to <laughs> had to go. That go was through. funding. Uh, was the difficulty of C- it completely funding related? No, yeah. a- absolutely. And we went from a seven million dollar you know facility to a four million dollar facility, mm-hmm. which, to be honest, is, is really more in line with with our needs as opposed to, to uh, this great big majestic f- facility that truly wouldn't have fit our campus and and, mm-hmm. and, and really wouldn't have fit our programs. It, it, it sounded great and it looked great at the time. But I think we ended up with the facility that, that we need and that our, our kids deserve. Well, and it's much different than the Bret Hart Theater in that the stage is what they call a thrust stage, right. which basically, if you folks are familiar with Stage 3 Theater over in Sonora, one of the professional theater companies, that's a thrust stage kind of a concept. You don't really have the stage with the audience sitting out there. The audience kind of quasi surrounds the stage so I would imagine that for students it can be quite an adventure to step out onto that stage because you're literally stepping out into that audience that can be a little bit daunting I can imagine yeah yeah it, it sets it up obviously for a much more intimate setting uh, mm-hmm. our, and our, I know our music teachers were, were, were a, a little concerned uh, about what that would look like you know both mm-hmm. acoustically but also aesthetically and, sure. and, and for the students themselves but watching them now watch and watching uh, the ability for for the crowd to wrap around them and for the sound mm-hmm. and just to really permeate the, 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 the whole spectrum of the facility. I think everybody is convinced now. I have music, the music staff coming back saying, yeah, this, this is what we, we needed. Oh, perfect. So, well, that's yeah, great. Very beneficial. Any other um, kind of, oh, that's right, the Toyon Kitchen. <laughs> yes. Now, a little bit of history for viewers. My dad was actually on the Calaveras Unified School District board when Toyon Middle School was given the green light to be built. And my dad has passed on, but I I always kind of wanted to ask him, why didn't you build a big enough kitchen, Dad? (laughs) And so, and that was, again, I'm sure, kind of funding what was available, because usually the state of California says you can build classrooms, but we're not going to give you a lot to build restrooms and other facilities that students will need. So you're actually getting to kind of put together a kitchen that's going to really serve that middle school correctly, right? Yeah, currently under construction. Yeah, okay. And, and so we, we, we look to have that open within three months. Okay. Uh, and, and so that's been another one of those, you know, really lo- long and arduous journeys that, that we, mm-hmm. we've undertaken. And, and, and that, you know, many people would ask those questions. Why, didn't, why wasn't it built? Why wasn't this? And, and I would just say that was before me. I don't know. But all I know is here's what we're doing now. Yeah, that's uh, right. And, and so we're, we're making it right for the kids and, and for the staff. Mm-hmm. So what, what kind of kitchen is it? Will, you know, the food actually be prepared there? Because I know that some of the elementary schools... I'm going to call it this, and I know you might get a little angry at it, but they're kind of TV dinners in a way, right. and, and they're heated up at the schools because I noticed that um, on one of your recent agendas, you've gotten several uh, grants for new ovens at a lot of the elementary schools, right? Correct. At it, 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 four. Four, four, four of them. Four, okay. four of the six. Uh, and and it, we talk about long, arduous journeys and epic sagas and, and, and whatnot. And this is another one of them in terms of food service. Mm-hmm. And it, because obviously we want to move to a, a healthier uh, offering for students. Sure. We've incorporated our gardens far more often. I was going to say, you've got more gardens than oh, just about anywhere else. And our food service staff is so open to it. So we balance be, needing to be f- fiscally stable. Mm-hmm. We balance needing to be compliant with, with state guidelines, but we also balance we, we need healthier offerings, and our staff has been moving in that direction. Uh, and That's so I, I see us getting there, and the Toyon Kitchen is just another piece of that because they can do scratch cooking there. It takes more oh, time, my. could, could yeah. take more staff, to, mm-hmm. but, but again, moving in that direction you know, slowly, but moving forward, and I think, and I think that's the key. Sure. Well, and I think the trick with that, again, is maybe a little bit of student involvement, you know, the the buy-in, Yes. obviously. I mean, if they help to grow it, they want to eat it. I I mean, we've all seen that at our community and school gardens, and it's just something else to see them be able to do that. The, um, I asked you this many, many years ago, and and I'm kind of interested to see what your response is to it now. What's the biggest challenge in educating kids Period. Did I see a playback? What I said earlier? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah the, the the biggest challenge really, besides the obvious answers, you know, mm-hmm. but the lack of money, the lack of time, and yeah. large class sizes, and all. I think it, it, a lot of it's just the external factors that we don't have control over. Mm-hmm. You know, what the students go home to. You know, the the, the students who go mm-hmm. home to just some some incre- incredibly 
poor surroundings it, it, without necessarily the, the food that they get at, at the school site mm -hmm. uh, to, to sustain themselves. Uh, the, the, what, what some choose to do with, with their free time and what options they have to do. You know, all, all these societal factors mm -hmm. uh, really, I think, play a part in, in, the, pro, in the kids who come to us sure. and then the kids we send back. I, so I think it's, it's us trying to navigate that, but also being asked to do so much more. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we transport, we feed, we counsel, we teach, you know, and, 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 we, and we do all these things for the whole child, which we, we sure. should we should be doing. Oh, you Some would argue that it's, you know, it's a parent's job or, or it's a community's job, whatever. I, mm -hmm. I, I believe that we're both parent and community. Yeah. But it, it's being able to address all those external factors to allow the kid the best opportunity to learn in the classroom, to allow them to be there and to focus because we've effectively addressed or at least mitigated all the external factors that, that could really impact their ability to learn. Speaking of external factors, the Butte Fire basically burned through the, the heart of Calaveras Unified School District. Um, really affected uh, the community of Mountain Ranch, which doesn't have a, a CUSD school anymore. But um, how has that affected the district? Have you l lost students that that lived in the area? Or? You know, amazingly enough, Mike, we we, ha we have not. Uh, you know, in fact, after the fire, our enrollment actually went up, and it wasn't because Goodness. kids from upcountry were moving down to our our, our, mm -hmm. our, our, our larger schools. Yeah. It, 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 it just it was a population boom to an extent on, on, the, on the, the West End. The emotional aspect of, of the students, again, the, the, the counseling, the support for the students and the families, dealing with the 57 students who lost homes. Goodness, uh, and, and, that's a and, big number. And, and, and navigating that. And obviously, we, mm -hmm. just like the community, are still navigating that. This is going to yeah. be a very, very you know, long recovery process, emotionally mm -hmm. and otherwise. Um, but but again, we talk about resiliency, and, and, and our students and our families are so resilient. This county is so resilient and supportive. Yep. So I think that, mm -hmm. all, that all, all plays a factor. So the, the fire is still an ongoing issue for us to deal with, but, but I think be, be, because of, of, of the love and the commitment of, of our staff and, and it, to, with our students, to our students mm -hmm. and, and our families, it, it, it's allowed CUSD at least to, to, to survive, if not thrive. Sure. And even through that, I mean, I, some of the interesting stories have been uh, basketball games where barely enough players to, you know, to staff the team were there, and yet the team wins. Right. I mean, that's one of those where you get the warm pitter-pat because you know that something was helping drive them, but um, at the same time you feel for those students that are left back. Um, or or fighting for their homes or suffering through the fact that they lost their homes. Do you get the feeling that those families are staying here? Yes. So, so yeah, I don't believe I answered the question. No, that's about okay. Students. You know, I, I believe we lost three students who had okay. to relocate because mm -hmm. of the fire, which when you look at 57 losing their homes and, and just the devastation yeah. you know, throughout, throughout yeah. our, our district, is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that we only had 57 students lose homes. Amazing that we, we've only lost three students. Yeah, that, that really does surprise me right. because we know that housing got really difficult. I mean, immediately in San Andreas especially, there weren't any rentals in town anyway, but boy, you know, as soon as the Butte fire hit, rentals literally dried up. Yes. So um, the uh, facilities that you have, some of them are going to need some maintenance. Do you hope and pray that the state of California kicks up and helps that, or how do you yeah, manage that? Yeah, in, in, in the hoping and praying, we, 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 do, we do on a daily <laughs> gave basis. gave up on our way. <laughs> but, 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 but cynically, yeah, we know we, that only goes so far. And, yeah. and, and knowing that the state actually is moving away from, from state bonds and moving away from, from school construction slash maintenance, mm -hmm. it really feels like we have to do that on our own. Yeah. Um, so we're, we are doing a better job of setting money aside for our for our deferred maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, but we but we also know that, that even with the declining enrollment, that we still have facilities in need. We don't mm -hmm. we don't need to build new schools. We don't need to build new classrooms. Yeah. But we have to address the ones that are, that, that currently exist. Um, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll say this now, and, and, and probably be crucified for it politically at some point. At at some point, we're going to have to look at a local bond or or a parcel tax. At mm -hmm. some point, I know politically, we're not even in a place to ask for that now. We yeah. did, we just finished off the, the last bond from sure. 2006. But unless the state does something different. I don't see how we, how we can address our needs, our infrastructure needs, mm -hmm. and, and, and our facility needs overall w without some type of extra infusion of, of, of funding. Well, and that's going to be statewide, I would imagine. I, I, I mean, would, I don't think you guys are hanging out there on a limb all no, by yourselves no, in this in no, any stretch. So. I, but I just know that, they, that given the budget issues that we faced the last eight years and, mm -hmm. and given the political divisiveness with, the, with the, our last bond, it, it's going to be a hard sell to the community. Mm -hmm. Understand that, get that, and we have to make a pretty compelling case in, in order for us to even have a chance at, yeah. and at some point in the future. 
Sure. What uh, what do you look forward to in the next couple of years with CUSD? Well, I, I, I look forward to years where we're not laying off staff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and actually, the, 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 any any decline at this point for this year that we, that we look at would just be enrollment based. Mm -hmm. uh, not, it wouldn't be budget based. We have th yeah. we we project three years of relative fiscal stability, mm -hmm. but come 2018, 2019, and, and again, we're not alone in this. Yeah. You know, the increased revenue coming in from the state doesn't even come close to keeping up with, with the expenditures that, yep. that, that we're having to, to deal with. And so come 2018, 2019, unless you're a basic aid district or mm -hmm. unless you're a district with a, with a high um, a degree of at-risk students, which will get you more state funding, mm -hmm. districts like CUSD are, are going to be facing a, a, a pretty huge challenge to remain fiscally stable, fiscally viable. And yeah. for us, that's 18, 19. So I look, so I look, I look forward to the stability that we have. I look forward to working with people on, on, mm -hmm. on trying to just maintain our fiscal responsibility mindset uh, and, and, and not, not seek to expand our, expen our, our spending pattern just because things sure. appear or feel good. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I look forward to the challenge, I guess, in working. And we have people who are really solutions oriented. And mm -hmm. so just being able to, to engage in that dialogue, because again, even when we disagree, our, our people are phenomenal, and we have the ability to sustain relationships and, and, and maintain open communication. And so I think that's the day-to-day -day challenge, but also the day-to-day -day reward that we have. That's just great. And that I'm going to say thank you for being here. I've got a couple minutes, and this is where I'm going to editorialize, folks, and I don't do this much. But um, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Cimenti at Bret Hart, uh, Ms. Tidball at Mark Twain, and um, Valacito is escaping me the superintendent. Don Ogden. Don Ogden, that's right. And I actually technically haven't met him. Okay. But these administrators do the absolute utmost best that they can with what you folks have given them. And the reason I say it that way is because when you go to vote for your state representative, you're sending somebody to Sacramento who usually when they're sitting around during an election year like this and telling you that they want your vote, they pretend that education is very important to them. But when it comes time to vote on a budget, those educational goals somehow manage to filter away and float away, and education ends up suffering like it has for the past 10 years. You, ladies and gentlemen, need to be very careful when you vote, and you need to hold these legislators to the fire. I say that knowing what I just said so that they do what they told you they were going to do when you voted for them. And if they're not doing what they promised, you need to call them on it. And I mean call their office, I mean write those letters, I mean get in their face about it. Because your children suffer when they're not doing their part when they're sitting in that big room in Sacramento. I congratulate our educators here in the county for doing so much with relatively little. Mr. Campbell, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mike Taylor. Join me next time on Mondo Calaveras. In the meantime, enjoy.